At that moment, I felt like committing suicide. I thought I should join my husband and children, that I should not live in this world. Somehow, and one can hardly fathom how, Pungazali has mustered enough strength to find work and keep what remains of her family going. But her husband and children are not the only casualty in this terrible story. We used to do everything believing in God. As all of them have died, my faith in God has gone. Is it that you're angry with God, or is it just simply that you don't believe in him anymore after what's happened? God is there, but I've lost my trust in him because he couldn't save my husband and my children. I hate God. There are dozens of stories like this in this very camp alone. Yet when you look to people for an account of why some die and others survive, always there in the discussions is the K-word, karma. If there's one idea that essentially divides Western and Eastern thinking on religion, it's the theory of karma and reincarnation. According to Hinduism, the karma, one's own actions is uh, responsible for, the, for his own suffering. Mm. So this theory of karma plays the vital role mm. in Hinduism. Karma means action and can be likened to the mechanism of a hotel elevator. In the cycle of reincarnation, your chances of where you end up in the next life depend completely on the spiritual capital you accumulate based on your good thought or action. There's no room for chaos or coincidence in this theory of the world. What goes round comes round. You reap what you sow. Only the being who has attained purity of action and mind is spared the cycle of endless rebirths after death. The rest undergo reincarnation until such time as they're ready to escape this and achieve moksha, becoming subsumed in what Hindus called Brahman, the eternal spirit that permeates the whole cosmos. Well, you know, a poor little child of three or four oh. seems a picture of innocence. Um, do they really, are they to be held responsible for? No. According to that theory, they may uh, did some wrong things in, the, in their previous lives. Not only death, you are having the deaf and dumb boys, even the child. So deaf and dumb it, children yeah, are paying the price say, for yes, previous yes, lives? Yes, it is due to some previous uh, actions. We had a football manager, Glenn Hoddle, oh. who got into a lot of trouble for suggesting that in England. Oh. In fact, he lost his job, I think, because oh. it was a very controversial. Oh. But do you really believe that, that the young children, they somehow, they are being held accountable by karma this when they die? This is the one way of giving my uh, answer. Karma had left me with a funny taste in my mouth. Had I misunderstood it? Or had it just come across as an untypically crude explanation of life and punishment? Karma's doing my head in, I have to say. I mean, I've listened to so many tales now of people who say that little children who died in the tsunami somehow are paying the price for previous lives that they've lived maybe centuries ago. And it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, karma as the idea that you reap what you sow in this life is absolutely fine. I mean, if I'm bad today, I might get some kind of punishment or there'd be bad consequences in a few weeks or months time. That's fine. But it's when it goes across lives. I mean, the idea that a two or three year old kid starts their life with a kind of negative bank balance that they somehow have to try and work through just doesn't really strike me as, as, as fair. The man who could help me out, I was told, was a famous guru in Bangalore, some 300 miles away, who rejoices in the exotic name of Sri Sri Ravi Shankar.
British Gas, we know your home is your world. You wake there, you relax there, you cuddle up in the warm there, you party there, you say goodbye and hello there. Ah, oh, the boiler's not working. Sometimes you need a little help there. Which is why you can reach us every day even over Christmas. Look after your world this Christmas with British Gas. Everest range of over 60 beautiful fitted kitchens are in our January sale. Call now on 0800 010 123. Now you don't want to miss out. The home base sale is now on with great savings across the store. Like selected lighting, paint and furniture now half price. Save £300 on this Colworth dining suite. What's more, until New Year's Eve, there's an extra 15% off everything when you spend over £50. Great sale prices at home base. Home insurance can be so expensive. Well, it says here when you join Churchill, you get 50% off home insurance if you haven't claimed in five years. Really, Churchill? Oh, yes. He's having you on. He told me he's off skiing with Eddie the Eagle. Mm. Churchill, help! <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, thanks, Churchill. Here, put one in there. And no ice. Oh. For 50% off <laughs> home insurance, <laughs> count on Churchill. Call or go online. Critics are going crazy for Nowhere oh. Boy. Ooh. Strong from the wrist. Strong from the wrist. <laughs> you want to be serious? Lennon. It's electrifying, fresh and original. I'm done. Oh. Inspired. I got my eye on you, too. And a joyous success. Oh. And is this with the new group? The, what are they called again? DK. Nowhere Boy in cinemas now. Prices these days. Oh. I know. But it says there you'll get free breakdown cover when you buy Churchill car insurance. Mm -hmm. Really, Churchill? Oh, yes. He's having a laugh. He told me he was doing a sponsored parachute jump at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> For free breakdown cover when you buy car insurance, count on Churchill. Call or go online. Friends, go to me. You're not fat, but I know I'm fat. Childhood obesity has become a national talking point. Now find out what it's really like to be growing up fat. Can't live on like this. None of you people know what it's like to be like me. Generation XXL starts Monday the 4th of January on 4. When you're off to meet one of the world's leading gurus, you want to look your best. Though there's a limit to exactly how tip-top a man can look at 6am after a restless night in a creaky bunk bed. Bangalore and the site of the ashram, the spiritual community of the Art of Living Foundation and its founder. Hello, Your Hello. Pleasure to meet you. I have to say that just quickly looking around at most of these, Ganesha seems to be the one, like when I travel around India, if I was keeping a little notebook of all the different gods, he seems to be everybody's favorite. Yes, it's a prominent. See, if you see Buddha and Ganesha, they both have a big stomach. Right. That's, that's a sign of joy. Right. You had to have a big tummy to exhibit you are really happy. Like Santa Claus, you know. <laughs> I'm not doing very well, am I, really? <laughs> so what did he make of kids dying because of bad karma? 
No, you see, what, whatever explanation you give for the past which has already happened, it should bring you peace. <laughs> That's the thing. See, li listen, uh, not that they all start with a negative bank account, they also have positive bank account. Some people do. Yeah. Everybody has some positive, some negative. I said, no life is, comes with total negative karma. It says, every child is born with divine light in them. See, karma is not all destiny. Karma goes with free will. It's called upaya. I wasn't confusing karma with fate. And yes, I accepted the role of free will. But if a child is prized from its parents because of previous bad karma, it hasn't been given very long to use its free will and turn things around. It was my first time in India. Maybe I was just out of my depth. Do you think there's a danger in coming at this God and suffering problem from too intellectual a point of view? Um, there is a saying in Upanishads, it's you can't measure the ocean with a spoon. You know? You can't capture the ocean in a spoon, but you can throw the spoon in the ocean. In the same way, through the little intellect, you cannot understand everything in the universe. But what you can do, you can live the mysteries of life. You can be part of it. You can. That is what is meditation is. Meditation is a central plank of the program run by the Art of Living Foundation to help tsunami victims. The sessions focus on the presence of the spirit within. Trauma, say its supporters, is relieved. The distraction of painful memories, of course, can be obstacles to us all. This mystic has a huge following amongst those who seek communion with that part of themselves which is eternal. It's all very well, but I was never a great meditator. This restless Western mind, when it doesn't drift off to worries of unpaid tax bills, starts asking questions all over again. What about poor Punguzali, who'd lost her husband and her three children? Well, you say people haven't given up on God. We met one woman who refuses to go to temple and says has, has lost complete faith in God. Um, uh, there are few people who might feel like that, of course, of course. But uh, that would stay for some time and then they get back, you see. There is a part for the suffering in the planet. Suppose there is no problem at all and all good qualities will also disappear. So tsunami had one good thing that, you know, human values got a boost. It's just that I don't like the idea of poor young children in Thailand and India and Indonesia suffering so that um, adult Americans and Europeans can come in and show how compassionate they are. It seems a cruel way that the world is ordered. I know, I know, I yeah. know. Mm, uh, if you see, if you see from the other angle, suppose there is no suffering at all, then there will not be any compassion. On my first trip to India, I'd been asked to ponder a major shift in my thinking and accept that there may be no God who can be put in the dock for natural disasters. For Hindus, God, or supreme reality, is the spiritual that resonates in all of living creation. But a steeper challenge yet lay ahead. My next destination was Thailand, and a Buddhist culture where the quest for God is rendered futile and a sense of the permanent denied outright. Bangkok and the festival of Songkran, a New Year jamboree for Buddhists of the Theravada tradition, with an emphasis on wishing your neighbors and friends good luck. And how do you do this? By dousing them all with water. Happy New Year! Thank you, thank you. Happy New Year time. Thank you very much. When temperatures are nearly 40 degrees, then a bit of water is actually quite refreshing, even if you hate the stuff like I do. It's one thing, though, when man's in charge of the distribution, what happens when the boot's on the other foot, when nature has the final say?
Kumala Temple, just outside of Phuket, home to a community of Buddhist monks. These men normally train their minds to exclude the distractions of the outside world, but last December, they were engulfed by forces beyond their control. I've never seen a wave that high before, so I told visitors, run, a giant wave is coming. Then I jumped and fled. As the water gathered pace, an old woman, Mani, was left stranded in the vicinity of the temple. The water was coming so fast, and there was no way we could run away from it. Faster and faster it came. Where am I supposed to go, I thought. It was purely human instinct that day that I'd run away. Then I remembered seeing Manny, and if something happened to her, then it would have stayed with me forever as a sin that I didn't go back. There was this monk. He told me to hold on to his robe. He told me to pull. But no matter what I did, I couldn't force myself up. Then I thought of the higher power. All of a sudden, I felt lighter and clearer. And then I made it. The abbot managed to save the lives of several visitors but three of his fellow monks were taken by the waves. Several months after the tsunami, we were present on the day that the abbot and Mani were reunited. Is there a bigger explanation to all this than just natural disaster? I knew that Buddhism had emerged from Hindu philosophy so it wasn't surprising to find, once again, the K-word figuring largely, but this time, karma of a collective variety. Some people were from abroad, so why did they die here together? Maybe in the last life they were from the same tribe, they did something bad together, and now they're being punished as a result of bad karma. The official tsunami death count off the Thai coast was more than 5,000 people. Two of those vanquished lives were those of 10-year-old Orawan and her five-year-old sister, Orapan. Their mother, Wolapa, had left them at home with her brother while she worked at a nearby hotel. Then the tsunami had struck with its full might. I ran as fast as I could. Then I remembered my kids were at home. I tried phoning them, but the network must have been down. So I ran up the hill to safety. I wanted to get down and to see them, but another wave came. So I had to spend the whole night away from them. I was praying that they were all OK. When I got down to the house the next morning, everything was destroyed. This is the story of what happened to the house. It's gone. The nail, I know, but... <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, that's on the ground, just lying on the, the terrace, and the next thing gets 20 feet up in the air, forced into the trees. The sheer force of that way, what chance would a, would a baby or a human being stand? After the water subsided, Wallopa and her husband were beside themselves with anxiety. We went to all the temples, but we didn't find them. Then, five days later, 
I found my little one. I recognized her from the photo, not because of how she looked, but because of her bangle and necklace. She was cremated on New Year's Day, but the older one I still haven't found. Perhaps my children committed bad sins in their previous lives and they paid the price. If I don't look at it like this, I won't be able to deal with it and let go. Since her children died, Wallopa has become a temporary member of a religious community. She believes that this good karma can help her children in whatever new existence they find themselves. She hopes to be a mother once more, but there's a terrible catch. Two ectopic pregnancies means she can only conceive through IVF, a course of action way beyond her financial means. If Wallopa was really lucky, she might be one of the few to benefit from new houses being erected by a Christian charity, the Mercy Foundation. Uh, we're evangelical Christians. We believe in the Bible. That this is the word of God. But we don't want to push that on anybody. We're here as an act of mercy building homes. This group of Christians makes no bones about its mission. Have some locals through the kind of missionary work that you've been doing here actually come to to use the religious language, know God, know Jesus? See many. many. It's quite a journey for them in terms of a, a transformation from where they start to this very different kind of approach. And I don't know if they'll stay, you know. It's one of these things where they're attracted to it, they're here, we're not asking them to come, we're not pushing it. They're listening to scripture and sermons and whatever. What about those skeptical voices who say, well, you know, you're building houses and you're just trying to get people to sign on the dotted line and become, become Christians? House Christians, instead of rice Christians, uh, so house Christians. House Christians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've been very sensitive that we told the government we're a Christian organization. We're going to come here as a total act of mercy. We're not going to do any of that other stuff because it's not that we just don't do that. We don't pass out tracks or force anything on anybody. I've seen groups have done it. It's very tacky. I mean, you know, you're a man of God. How do you make sense of uh, natural disasters and a, an all-loving, benevolent, powerful deity? I can't make sense of it. You know, a loving God, why would he do this? I don't, I don't go there. So. He didn't want to go there, as he put it, but he couldn't have been less reluctant when it came to having a dig at the relief efforts of the local Buddhists. And I'll tell you, the most disappointing I've seen is the acts of the Buddhist priests and what they've done in the disaster has been un incomprehensible, how do I say it? I don't want to be too critical, but... No, but what, what do you mean by that? Nothing. Sitting there, you know, offering counseling and, you know, and the people have to come and offer things and pay money and, you know, to get a body burned and I just... I've heard a lot of really very, very disturbing things that I've never expected to hear from a disaster zone. This isn't exactly a fair take on Buddhism. There's a key concept that Buddhists call sila, getting stuck in to alleviate suffering. There's more to Buddhism than fancy metaphysical ideas. There's a teaching from the Buddha that goes something like this. If somebody fires an arrow into you and it goes straight into your arm, you don't spend all your time asking questions like, who made the arrow or where did the arrow come from? No, the important thing is practical action. Heal the wound. The community of monks at the Samakitan temple have housed a group of sea gypsies, men and women who made their living out of fishing and who lost all their sailing vessels when the tsunami dashed their boats on the rocks. After this calamity, there was only one place to head for. When the tsunami happened, I thought this would be a good place to come to. The monks here are a source of stability. They would never abandon us because they are men who are steeped in virtue. Uh, this is a local fishing boat. Yeah. For Thai people, we call it long tail boat, you see? Yeah. Long tail boat. The abbot was an engineer before he became a monk and takes more than a passing interest in the challenges ahead. 
With the help of international aid, a succession of boats have been kitted out with motors, which will help these people to make their living once again. Do you give uh, each boat different names or the same name? No, the same name, other boat that may from here. What's, what's from the here. name? What's the name you give it? Uh, the name is Samaki Tam and Kla Thale, number one, two, three, four, five. And what does that mean in English? Uh, Samaki Tam, the name of my temple. Kla Thale, the name of their family name. So it's like a partnership Kla between thale, the temple and the family? Kla Thale yeah. means strong to go to the sea. Yeah. It's been a healing experience for this monastic community to see such tangible results. But other monks have had a harder job of it. What happens when overnight you're suddenly told your monastery is now a mortuary? Critics are calling The Road one of the best films of the year. How many people are still alive? In the world? Not very many. Haunting and beautifully made. You look at him again, I'll shoot you in the head. <laughs> Keep him warm. He goes south. Magnificent, superb, a classic. It's like it used to be when the sun came out. Viggo Mortensen and Charlize Theron. They're not going to quit. The Road, in cinemas January 8th. The stunning new dual-screen Samsung ST550. With an LCD screen on the front and the back. Two screens, twice the fun. Smooth vanilla ice cream with natural vanilla flavor from Madagascar. Experience Carte d'Or Vanilla. Give more, give Carte d'Or. Beat the VAT increase at the Curry Sale now. There's £90 off this top-of-the-range Dyson DC25 animal with ball technology, now only 199 And save £150 off this A-rated frost-free Hoover fridge freezer, only 249 Hurry, they're only while stocks last at the Curry Sale. your year eight students. We certainly are. Yeah, I'm Fantastic really looking bunch. forward to that. So what about if you haven't got the money to buy something? Well, usually you have my mum there, and she usually have money. <laughs> you could save it, but the other thing is you don't have to look in any shop windows. <laughs> I'm going to run through budgeting with them. Lovely. And about savings. Who can tell me what a standing order is? I don't know. You don't know? Is it one that comes into your bank account? You're nearly right. <sighs> What do you think you've got out today? Not to go shopping with Seb, otherwise you'll be broke in five minutes. Yeah. Since 1994, our Money Sense for Schools programme has helped school children throughout the UK learn the importance of money management. NetWest, helpful banking. At Halford's biggest ever sale, even better than half-price deals. These Apollo bikes are better than half-price. This Navman sat-nav, this CD stereo, this Graco child seat, they're all better than half-price. Plus, you can reserve online and collect in store. Better than half price deals at the Halford sale now. Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. Since we've no place to go, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. Baileys. Unwrap, share, enjoy. They should have been holiday videos. Instead, they captured history unfolding. Tsunami, caught on camera, Wednesday at 9 on 4.
Tsunami Where Was God continues now on 4 with footage of the wave, the devastation it caused and some of its victims. Some viewers may find these images distressing. In the aftermath of the tsunami, Buddhist temples became the focal point for a whole variety of essential tasks. Yan Yao Temple became the rendezvous point for identifying the dead. Thousands of corpses lay decomposing in the December heat. What was the smell like during this period? Was, was there a, a very strong smell of, of decomposition? The stench was so overpowering. You could smell it two kilometers from here, as far as the hospital. So when you were praying at night, you had this uh, smell of death in your mind all the time? Yes, we had to close doors and windows and block everything to stop it, but it still got through. The monks here have had some poignant practical lessons in embracing one of the Buddha's central teachings, the transience of all living things. Suffering, or dukkha, said the Buddha, stemmed from ignorance. Trying to hold on to worldly cravings and the fear of death can only be conquered by meditation and a disciplined mind. Death is your best friend, your closest relative, and a friend that will never leave you. I'm not afraid of death. The only thing I'm afraid of is my own mind. It's fine, of course, to pay lip service to not being afraid of dying, but I wonder just how closely this monk had pondered the images in a makeshift ID gallery just a stone's throw from his temple. This huge sort of monument to death um, takes me back to a job I had several years ago as a hospital porter, and I'm not squeamish about death. I mean, I've handled dead bodies, uh, I've dealt with mortuaries, um, but when you see so many of them, I think what really strikes you is the fact that on some of the faces, the image of death is very serene and very tranquil, and that's quite comforting in a way. But for others, there's a, a look of real trauma at that moment where death is about to extinguish life. And I think that makes it so hard because when Buddhists say, you know, death is just part of life, you have to accept it, that's all very well. But you look at these pictures and you think, God, no. This Swedish man moved to Thailand three years ago. Since the tsunami, Bjorn Muller has been trying to get a project off the ground in a village near Phuket. What I'm trying to do is, is um, uh, raise funds to open uh, a kindergarten slash nursery here in Kosare. Bjorn has brushed with death before. He used to run a glitzy restaurant. One of the most sought after venues in New York Kathy Cha was a mere 400 meters away from the World Trade Center. I was doing really well. I thought that I had it made and, you know, was thinking about the next step. But then 9-11 uh, happened and that totally just swept the carpet under your feet, you know. I flew from New York, Tokyo in January 2002. I haven't been back to New York since. Bjorn traded the manic pressure of Manhattan for peace and tranquility, working as a diving instructor in southern Thailand. A year ago, for the second time in his life, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Did you lose any people near and dear to yourself? Yeah, I did. Who? Relatives of mine in Kaulak, a whole family. Posted by a... The tsunami, as I'd already seen on my travels, had thrown up some eyebrow-raising responses from people of religious faith but I wanted to draw Bjorn's attention to something I'd picked up on my research on the website of a Baptist church in Kansas. Um, the, what? <laughs> Thank God for the tsunami and for 5,000 dead Swedes. I mean, obviously this guy is on another planet, right? 
I don't know. I mean, inside I can say a lot of things, but uh, yeah. you can probably read in my eyes what I feel like doing to a guy like this, right? But it wasn't a joke. The church in question takes particular exception to what it sees as lax laws on homosexuality in liberal countries like Sweden. We gave Bjorn his chance to hook up with the Kansas Christians some 10,000 miles away. Uh, is that Westboro Baptist Church? Oh, yes. Um, could you just hang on a sec, please? When I say to you that some of my relatives, yeah, they were children, died here in Thailand in the tsunami, do they have anything to do with this issue you have about homosexuality and God? All the people that died in that, um, in that tsunami were sinners, but listen to this, listen to this. Uh, Jesus Christ said, uh, was it eight people that died in the... In the tower, well, there was a tower called Siloam and it fell. Were the eight people, were they um, t uh, sinners above the rest? May I say, but if you don't repent, if you don't uh, repent, you, sh you shall likewise perish. So it doesn't matter how much of a sinner they are. They weren't doing their job. Okay, my relatives, okay, two children died in the tsunami, okay, from Sweden, here in Thailand. What have they done? You're saying that they did something to deserve that? They raised them to the devil because they weren't being raised the way they should have been. How about that? Yeah. Well, are you on some kind of medication? Yeah, I'm on medication. Are you on some kind of medication or what's up with you? Okay, you... No, quit doing that. Quit mocking me. You know I'm not doing... Uh, on drugs or whatever. I'm mocking you. I'm not mocking you. But it seems like you guys are... Wait, wait, wait. It seems like you guys are... It's, I have it in print here. You are mocking people, and you're mocking people that are dead, you know? Uh, it says that God laughs and mocks when the wicked die. That's what it said. Do you want me to give you the verse? Yeah. Okay. Wait a second. It's in Proverbs 1. I'm just looking on my computer. Just give me a second. Oh, you don't know it by heart? Uh, not this particular verse. So, so much hatred, you, you can't harbor that in your heart alone, you have to have it on the computer too? I'm sorry? I said, shut up! Are you... You know, you probably don't know a single verse, so you know what, away with that. Now, if you have any more questions, you can email on godhatebags.com. Um, Bjorn had been on the receiving end of this tirade, not because he was gay. His only offense, possession of a Swedish passport. I used to think that in a world already on the rack with suffering, that religion had an obvious role to play in alleviating pain with a gentle compassion. But I hadn't reckoned with Westboro Baptist Church. If this is what God truly wants from religion, then make me a disciple of Richard Dawkins. I was nearing the end of my stay in Thailand, and I'd been impressed by the Buddhists I'd met but I was conscious that I'd left the really big questions until the end. I savoured an encounter with a rare person in these parts, an ordained female religious, and I wanted to know what the Buddhists made of God, and what, if anything, of us survives death, since I'd been told they don't even believe in the self. It was like a revelation. So you prepare them for The self is there, but it's not permanent, and it's not what you want it to be. You have no control, so to say. Does the self survive death? In Buddhism, we, we explain it, uh, it's, like, it's like this. It's not this person who died, Mr. A, who died, and then be reborn again as Mr. A, no. Mr. B, who is reborn after Mr. A, is the result of the culmination of the action of Mr. A. But Mr. B is not Mr. A. The Buddha used the example of a candle flame to underline his teachings about the transience of all things. When you use a flame to light a second candle, the impression is that the first flame has simply jumped and is now present in the second. But every flame at every second is a unique constellation of dynamic energy, and so it is with every living being. One of the central tenets of Buddhism is that the notion of a fixed identity or self is but an illusion. My name is a mere social convenience for an aggregate of matter, perception and consciousness. 
There's nothing substantial or indestructible about these. They're all part of the ceaseless flow and change of all things. I hope you're comfortable sitting there. In death, this constantly shifting energy is reincarnated, again depending on good or bad karma, in a higher or lower life. But only the individual who has disciplined his mind and spirit, like the Buddha, can escape the cycle. As a flame blown out by the wind goes to rest and cannot be defined, so the enlightened man, freed from selfishness, goes to rest and cannot be defined. Gone beyond all images, gone beyond the power of words. But what about God? Is Nirvana about being united with the Creator? Did the Buddha teach that there was no God? Or did he just simply say, you can't prove or disprove it, so it's a waste of time even bothering about it? You know, we are not atheists. That is, you know, we deny completely right out that there is no God. We are rather, I would call, uh, non-theist. So, uh, whether God is there or not is not our main concern. If God created us, that's well and good, I'm here already. So I will make the best use of what I'm here for. You know, that, that attitude. I had found Buddhism strangely seductive. I could dispense with the God question, and all those concerns about natural disasters and religious belief would just evaporate. But such a change would carry risks and painful sacrifices. For the whole of my life, I'd been raised on the notion of a personal God, a God who in some way knows every hair on our heads and even cares for us when mothers might forget their own children. In light of what I'd encountered on this trip, was such a belief now still credible? Back in the UK, I reflected that, almost without exception, the tsunami had intensified rather than diminished people's sense of faith. Despite his fearsome reputation, this was a finding I eagerly wanted to share with Richard Dawkins, the no-nonsense atheist who'd figured so prominently in the press a year ago. It may be the case that the tsunami, rather than weaken religious belief as you would prefer, has probably actually strengthened religious belief for large sections of the planet. That's something that you have to face up to, isn't it? I think it, it weakens arguments for the kind of religious belief that thinks of God in terms of intervention, thinks in terms of the kind of being who answers our prayers. That really is a problem. If you believe in that kind of God, then you have got problems. If you, through your mind, forward to the 10 seconds before you die, looking back, is there not looking at the fact that the universe does not contain within itself the reason for its existence, a part of you that just might have a little wobble there? I don't think the fact that I'm just about to die would have anything to do with it. Uh, I, w I would certainly have wobbles about my own capacity to understand the universe. I mean, good heavens, that's an enormous problem, an enormous deep, deep, deep question. And who am I to say that I understand it? Of course I don't understand it. So does that leave God totally out of the question? Apparently not. But the kind of God that I would respect people for believing in would be the kind of God of the deists who, who set the universe up in the first place, who set up the laws of physics, perhaps in such a way that it would be likely to bring the conditions for evolution into existence something of that sort. But that kind of grand god of the physicists is not the kind of god who's going to be the slightest bit interested in uh, listening to the odd prayer. When someone like Dawkins leaves the room open for some kind of take on God, you know that all hope isn't lost. My search for answers was nearing a critical climax, and in an observatory run by Jesuit priests, I was about to make my decisive breakthrough. Our half price sale is now on. And the icing on the cake is... Until closing time Tuesday, we're also taking 15% off everything. That's everything. Simply spend over £50. Yes, 15% off everything, even on top of our sale prices. Did I say off everything? 
TVision is a clever way to watch digital TV. It not only gives you Freeview and the Vision Plus box to record TV, but also an incredible world of TV on demand, ready to watch whenever suits you best. It's the only TV service with a selection of catch-up TV from all main channels. And you can browse and select from a virtual library of the latest blockbusters, like X-Men Origins Wolverine, to box sets like CSI New York. BT Vision, the TV you want, when you want it. Call 0800 the Sainsbury sale is now on. You'll find lots of fantastic homeware and stylish two clothing at up to half price. Lunch on the go giving you indigestion? There's a cool way to get fast relief. Rennie Ice. How cool is that? And also available in a pocket pack. How cool is that? You, but on a really good day. Car, Car insurance. Let's go, go, go. Electric bill is paid by oh, direct debit. debit. It's home, yeah, home. <laughs> You're the same age as my sister. <laughs> that's really weird. 58 results we've got here. Oh, that's better. See, that's cheaper. That's, that's really cheap. good. So they're both in. less than what I'm paying. You can save, what, 167. Woo! <laughs> Additional driver? No. Would you trust me no. with your car? <laughs> Cushion yourself with an ING Direct savings account. ING Direct. Saving feels good. We're Intel. Sponsors of Tomorrow. At Bath Store, we look at bathrooms differently, so everything, even the price, is designed by us. But it's not just about good looks. Everything's beautifully made, too. Like our solid brass taps, which have a 15-year guarantee. And right now, there's up to 50% off in the Bath Store sale. See bathrooms as we see them at over 160 stores nationwide or at bathstore.com. Did anybody vote for Big Brother? I don't know whether to laugh or to weep. Really? What have you chosen as the greatest TV show of the noughties? A great night out in. And which song did you vote for? He's hit it. Bang on. Your favourite tracks and telly from the last ten years starts with the greatest TV shows of the noughties after Tsunami Where Was God? The final stage of my quest to reconcile belief in God with the existence of pain and suffering in the world has brought me to Italy. Perched high above Lake Albano, just 20 miles southeast of Rome, lies a building that holds out the promise of some of the answers. This is Castel Gandolfo. It's the site of the Pope's Summer Palace, home to the Vatican Observatory, and I'm here for a week-long conference on the laws of nature, God and evil. Buongiorno. Why does the Vatican have an observatory run by a team of high-powered Jesuits? This solar telescope carries a powerful symbolic message to the outside world, that there is no basic conflict between scientific inquiry and the realm of faith. God is the best explanation that I have for why there should be a universe in the first place. Not how it functions, but why it should be anyway. 
and why, so why we should exist. There's a fascinating way in which one finds the universe is put together. Then I find that, yes, creation reflects the creator. But if creation reflects on the creator, after what has seemed an unprecedented year of planetary havoc, the assembled gathering of scientists and theologians at this observatory-sponsored conference know they've got a lot on their plate. Well, good morning, and I, we're getting ready for the second day of uh, discussion. Each of these people has been asked to prepare a paper for the group, but surprisingly, when the tsunami came up for reflection, it wasn't in totally negative terms. Uh, there's this excellent uh, two-page article on why there couldn't be life, any complex life at all, on the surface of the Earth if we didn't have a, a movable crust. And if we have a movable crust, you're going to have earthquakes. And if we have earthquakes underwater, we're going to have tsunamis. If, if we didn't have a crust that, that moved, uh, ultimately, with erosion, the whole surface of the planet would be basically smooth. Given the amount of water on it, it would probably be marshland all over. And so you could have some simple forms of life, but you certainly couldn't have um, um, complex animals like us. And then also, it, it replenishes the sort of elements at the sur on the surface that we need. If there were no recycling of the crust, uh, basically the whole planet would become infertile after a certain period of time. So what works well for the equilibrium of the system isn't always kind to individuals at the cutting edge. But this made a lot more sense to me than that talk in Banda Aceh of a god who uses tsunamis to vent his spleen about tight clothes. And for all of his obsession with the apocalypse, hadn't that geologist, if only I'd listened more attentively, been pointing out an essential truth? Tetapi Allah menjaga keberlangsungan bumi However, God protects the sustainability of the planet through regeneration. The old will be replaced by the new. The planet isn't static. And I also thought back to that image of Lord Shiva in India and the utter inseparability of creation and destruction, and now learned that there was a Christian narrative too that echoed this take on the world. You see that physical evil is absolutely necessary for physical good. Can you give some examples of that? How you okay. can't separate the one. The from hurricane the other? that happened in New Orleans was absolutely necessary in order to have heat exchange, okay, from one part of the continent to the other. Otherwise the earth would not be habitable. And then Mark, if you permit, I take that to the um, a theological level. Scripture is full of, and Catholic tradition is full of, unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, next year you will not have wheat. Matter, of its very nature, is subject to death and decay. And God, it's argued, can no more create a material world without rough edges than make two and two equal five. But couldn't a supreme intelligence have fashioned things according to entirely different laws of nature, which would still allow for the evolution of complex human creatures with free will like ourselves? Even Dawkins, who's no friend of Christianity, would say there's probably no other way by natural processes to have evolved creatures which have these capabilities, not this amino system, or let alone morphology, but these capabilities we have, then through variation and selection. If that's the case, then that means that rather than being a consequence of what of the fall in the Christian tradition, death, suffering, disease, and extinction are constitutive of the very processes which build life and community. Taking a breather from the rarefied discussions, I wandered down to the serene lake below. Okay, I thought. So if the rough and the smooth are just part of the inevitable structure of existence, fair enough. But if God knew that tsunamis and their like were about to create havoc, couldn't God just step in once in a while before people get hurt? 
Well, if God did it all the time, we couldn't have science at all. If the world weren't predictable, then we couldn't be held responsible for our actions. Suppose uh, it were the case that sometimes when people fell off of walls, uh, God uh, sent his angels and, and lifted them up, and other times didn't, and you came and, and gave me a push, uh, presuming that God would send his angels. Clearly God would send an angel for someone like me, right? <laughs> but suppose God didn't. Uh, Nancy is dead. You, we just can't act morally in a, in a universe where uh, God might or might not come along and uh, undo the nasty consequences of our nasty actions. These religious scientists have given me plenty to chew on, but one nagging question persisted. The one raised by the Russian author, Fyodor Dostoevsky, in his 1881 classic. If you can't create without some degree of suffering, then why bother in the first place? Is it really worth uh, the suffering of one innocent creature, Dostoevsky says. If you had to press the button on creation and produce that, is it justifiable? Yeah, that's a tremendous question. And if I don't stop in silence before your question, then I'd say I don't get it. Anyone who sees the depth of the suffering that happens in our world and answers that question simply, oh, of course, of course it was all worth it, doesn't get it. I would love to imagine a divine who stood before that button and wept and somehow at the last minute felt it was better to have us than to have only the divine in eternal emptiness. You and I would probably not push the button as Ivan argued against Alosha in the Brothers Karamazov. We shouldn't push the button. And that God pushed that button and made creation hints at a mystery that we don't understand. It hints at a resolution that we can only hope for. God will only be God if the outcome is something so far better than what we see around us that it would make it all right. But I can only say that as a wish and a hope and not as an item of knowledge. That all will be resolved in the fullness of time can seem on occasion a forlorn hope. There are times we want to do nothing more than shake our fists at the heavens. But that kind of rage isn't something to be ashamed of. It has a long tradition and can often keep our faith alive. In the Psalms, you have complaining all the time. David will dance before the Lord, but also complain about God's injustice. This is the way of maintaining a connection with a God, uh, to complain, not to tame the model of God, to make it digestible. No, let God be wild, let God be crazy, and let us live with it. And there we discover love and grace and joy, but not full comprehension, and certainly no taming of the divine nature. quest which had started in a Derbyshire village by watching my father shaking his head in horror at the TV screen a year ago was nearing its end. I now reluctantly accept that suffering and pain are built into the natural processes that allow there to be life on the planet at all. God doesn't will these things to torture us, it's simply that light always casts an unavoidable shadow. I now wanted to share these findings with my troubled father but this journey had one final sting in its tail. That Derbyshire village where my father